Testing one, two, one, two, one, two, one, two, one, two. Yeah, I just realized I hadn't turned myself on. All right. Good evening, everybody. Are we here? Yes, we're up. Yep. I hear, I hear me talking in the background there. I didn't see any picture. Well, welcome, everybody, and uh, it's Wednesday night, Hour of Power, and we're glad to have you with us tonight, so praise the Lord. Uh, we're blessed that you are joining us on Facebook, and I uh, hope that you'll be blessed tonight. Let's go ahead and get, in, uh, get into the Word tonight. Let's open our Bibles, if we will, to the second book of Chronicles uh, in the seventh chapter, Second Chronicles chapter 7. And God, you know, if you, if you read prior to this, God's kind of, uh, there's, there's a little rebuking going on. And um, God's telling him he's going to shut up heaven and uh, command the locusts to devour the land and send pestilence and, you know, all this kind of stuff if they, uh, if they don't get their act together. You know, sometimes we got to get our act together. <clears throat> and, um, but then he comes back in verse 14 and says this, If my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and their sin, and heal their land. Hallelujah. Now mine eyes shall be open, and my ears attent unto the prayer that is made in this place. Now here he goes. I'm listening. I'm looking. Now if you'll do this, I mean, what God's letting me know is, hallelujah, I'll be right there ready to roll. A to the men. Amen. So, God's word is timeless, folks. You know that. You know um, God's word is always true. It doesn't. It doesn't fade. It doesn't vanish. It doesn't fade away. It doesn't become obsolete. You know. I mean, the the, the new narrative today is. You know that the um, Bible is obsolete. Um, you know, um, and that we got to get modern. You know, when you got you got these politicians trying to uh, make statements about that Jesus would be happy. With uh, the uh, stand on their stand on abortion and this kind of stuff, Jesus would support it, um, and um, that's so stupid you can't even you can't even wrap your head around the fact that anybody would be stupid enough to say it. But when you're full of the devil, you change just because the times have changed. Okay. People, the Bible te teaches people grow, uh, wax worse and worse. They become more darkened. They become uh, more alienated against things uh, as time goes on, and they're not serving God. It's, it is the uh, consequence of a continual rebellion against God. Okay? So, uh, but God's word stays, remains true. It remains steadfast. Um, you know, they, they want to come back and teach new math or, core, or common core math, which is some of the dumbest stuff you've ever seen. Uh, some, some idiot had to sit around and come up with that one because it makes no sense to anybody. Probably don't even make sense to them, but they got, they got paid to write the textbook and, uh, you know, and then get everybody to do it, so they made money off of, of getting everybody to do it. God's Word is timeless just like gravity is timeless. Gra gravity is You may be able to supersede it for a moment, but let me tell you, honey, it's there. Do you know the reason when an airplane takes off, it doesn't fly out into space? Gravity. Gravity keeps it uh, where, it, where it's going. They use the law of thrust and lift to ascend to a certain height and that kind of thing. But let me take, turn off the engines. Remove the thrust. The lift disappears. And guess what's raw? It was operating the whole time. The gravity was still there. It'll pull that plane right to the ground. Quicker than you can realize. Okay? Because it's. Float up in outer space. It's in operation. 2019. It's still the truth. Amen. Um, 
So it's just as more, it's just as relevant today as it was the day it was written. Okay. Um, God's always demanded His people remain consecrated and dedicated to Him and His cause. It is vital for the church to remain actively submitted to the Lord and His Word. Now, here in Second Chronicles, uh, seventh chapter, we are given four things that God requires of His people in order to consistently bless them. Now, the first one is so um, we've got four things. Um, man, that. A little, let me get erased a little bit. Uh, needs to be erased. All right. Um, the four things. From Second Chronicles. Yeah. Seven. Okay. So. God says for us to humble ourselves. Now, at face value, this is this is often a difficult thing for people or process for many people. Because too often they believe that they're faultless or they're in no need of humbling. You know? I'm humble, you know. Um, just ask me, I'll tell you, I'm humble. Okay? Um, however, the word humble carries a, a a deeper meaning than maybe a first glance, surfacey, you know, kind of whatever. Uh, comes from the Hebrew Cana. Cana. K A N. It means to be humbled, to humble, to be humbled, to be subdued. To be. Brought will to God's desires. This so Canaan it means to be humbled, to be humbled, and to be brought into. Hey, do whatever you want to do, you're still going to heaven, thing. All right? Some of the stuff we, we preach just doesn't bear out with Scripture. Well, that's the Old Testament. God didn't change just because we got from... Okay? Now, the methods he dealt with man changed in the covenant. Even the law was given. Perfect by the law. But all those things that were in the law that God wanted, God wants. God wants us, God, God wants us to live without. His will. Plans. Don't change just because we're under the New Testament. Okay? God's plan from the beginning has always been God's plan. To live in harmony with Him. Okay, who, who, so let me tell you something, if you think you can just walk out uh, in a place of non-subjection to God or be out of subjection to
or, you know, and, and he, he was trying to overthrow God. He didn't want to be in subjection to God. Yet this word, humble yourself, so if my people which are called by my name shall humble themselves, you bring yourself into subjection to God's will, to God. How? We have to know what the word says. Give you the out to do anything you want to do anytime you want to do it instead of following after God. Okay? Our hearts should be to pursue Him fully and not look ways, not look for ways to cater. That's the the the, the blowback on the some of the extreme teachings we get in the church. Well, you're you're under grace. It doesn't matter what you do. You got you know. We're we're not teaching people. Now you can't pursue God out of your out of the flesh with everything you got in your flesh because you don't want to die and go to hell. Okay, so yeah, that's that's legalism. But your heart should want to pursue God and honor Him. All right. But in that, you're going to, you can't live in sin and live according to the world and live, live according to self, to be humble, to be subdued. Uh, and these are different. Being in obedience to God's word will keep you in good standing. Isaiah 119, and I, somebody rewrote that. One of these, these, and, I, and I, let's don't get upset with one of these gracers, people who are trying to teach stuff to the extreme that, you know, you can live any way you want to live and it doesn't matter stuff. Now, I'm not talking about people who have a, have a clear. Understanding of grace, okay? I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about the ones. So bad because you were out living get drunk, running around with women, sinning, and you're being told it's okay. Okay? All right. But Isaiah 119 says, if you be willing to took out that, that, that scripture saying what it said. Let me say this. Without willingness is bondage. It's it's legalism. We're gonna find that out. We're gonna find that in the heart. The heart of the willing if you be willing and obedient. About the attitude of the heart. Brother Hagen, Brother Hagen tells a story. If you go back and listen to his old tapes, you'll hear him tell it. He, you know, he said, he started arguing. He said, I've been obedient. I've done what you told me to do. I've done this. I've done that. I've been obedient. He said, and after he fussed a little while, the Lord said to him, you want some wine, uh, some cheese to go with that wine? He said, you've been, you've been um, obedient, all right. You did it without the willing heart. You're trying, he was trying to get the, eat the good of the land blessings on just being obedient but not being willing. People who were trying to teach grace in a way to get people to understand. We take something and try to go to the extreme with it. Okay? Faith people. Their faith's out there.
You got the faith on the same woman. You can't cut her up. <laughs> Scripture comes in and says, if ye be willing and obedient, you'll, you'll, you'll eat the good of the lamb. We have to understand. Our actions are actions that are governed by a heart before for God. A Good. This is conditional, folks. There, I mean. Okay, I meant read the New Testament. That's about as new as you can get. And Jesus said to the, one of the churches, tried them that said they were prophets and weren't prophets at all. That, but, 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 but I've got. Because I would wish you were either hot or cold, but because you're lukewarm, I'll spew you out of my mouth. They got reproved, okay? God demands, listen, this is the very first thing. If my people which are called by my name shall humble themselves and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven and heal them. We're going to be brought into subjection. So that we have a willing heart to be obedient. The willing heart of obedience is required for obedience to be profitable. Okay? You can't get around it. You, you've, got, you've got to do it. You've got, you've got to have that willing heart. You've got to have a heart that loves God and pursues God. You want to obey God because you love him. Not because you have to. Okay? Now, we have natural laws that you have to obey, whether you like it or not. But that, and you, know, you know why natural laws are given? To constrain the hearts of evil men. Okay? Thou shalt not murder is not, shouldn't have to be given to a Christian. You shouldn't be going around and killing people or, or, or taking innocent life. I mean, self-defense is a whole different ballgame. But going around just walking into somebody and shooting because you want their car, want their money, that's murder. God shouldn't have to tell you not to take innocent life, not to murder. <clears throat> not if your heart's after him, right? So laws are given, natural laws are given, and they're given to people who don't want to obey them. And it's to constrain them, to keep them in check. The law was given as a schoolmaster to bring us to Christ. Why? Because the hearts wanted to rebel. Now, when Christ has come, are you here? Now, remember, Jesus said something very interesting. He said, I didn't come to do away with the law. I came to fulfill it. I came to fulfill the law. I came <coughs> to live the law, not out of <coughs> obedience, stark obedience so I could be saved. I came to live the law in honoring my Father. I came to fulfill it because I love my Father. And he studied it. That's, that's what he did. So I came not to do away with the law, but to fulfill it. Meaning what? Meaning what? That the things contained, the principles contained in the law, are you here? Are still principle God adheres to. Now, well, what about the Sabbath? Remember, the Sabbath was given to force them to rest. So the New Testament says they that have entered into faith have entered into rest. God wants you to have rest spiritually. What? From your efforts. What? To be righteous or to, to create a relationship. Our relationship with him is based on a faith relationship. Yes. It's based in grace. 
Yes. But you still need to obey and do the things he says do. Yes. I'm not earning righteousness by doing that. I'm showing my heart of obedience to him. See, it's a different, you know, it's, it's just a different, a different way of looking at it instead of, oh, if you tell me that I can't commit adultery, then you're putting me under the law. What? Bonehead. If you're willing to go commit adultery, your heart's not right. I still get to go to heaven, maybe quicker than the rest of us, especially if her husband finds out or your wife finds out. You might, you might get to find out real quick if you were going to heaven or not. Yeah. Okay. So, so he says here, first of all, if my people which are called by that my name shall humble themselves, humble themselves, he brought them to subjection. So we, we're to the willing heart. Okay. God's moral code, will, his purposes are the things we should be pursuing with our heart and obeying him what he says to do to get there. Now, I don't care what anybody says, tithing is New Testament. Else Jesus in the book of Hebrews wouldn't still be receiving them. Hello. I don't believe in the tithe. Well, do you, why don't you go tell Jesus you don't believe in the tithe? He's out there waiting for them. Okay? All right? He, he, in other words, when you give naturally here, he received that, that tithe in heaven. Okay? I don't believe the tithe is New Testament. Then you got, your Bible got cut up, mixed up. Hebrews ended up somewhere in the Old Testament. Because that's where it is. But some of the new stuff they do now is, that's not, that's not in the new script. That's not in the, the original translation. We've got scholars. So now they're getting scholars who say what they want to hear. They're rewriting the Bible. And the Word of God says that anybody that does that be a cursed anathema. Anathema is not a good word. You don't want to be anathema. Anathema. <laughs> okay? Hallelujah. All right. So, so the first thing is we've got to humble us. Secondly, secondly, pray. This is not talking about, oh, Jesus, help me somehow, some way. Actually, the, the, the particular word here in, in Hebrew uh, lends uh, emphasis to this intercession. It means to intercede. It is here that the heart of the church is brought to light. God requires of us that we capture his heart. One of the misnomers that came out of our word of faith circle, and I'm, listen, I'm not saying every church did it, but we preach things. And let me say this. A lot of times I would preach. Uh, Tony Cook said something a number of years ago. I mean, I've, I've never forgotten this statement. And, um, but he said, we have too many people trying to export what they haven't fully imported yet. They're trying to export what they haven't fully imported. Well, it's kind of hard to export what you have. In other words, you're, you're going to export these goods on the East Coast to England that you're waiting to come in on the West Coast from China. But your ship's sailing out to England, and the stuff hadn't even got here from China. What are you going to get there? Nothing. It's going to show up in England with nothing there. Okay? And we got a lot of Christians trying to export spiritual things they haven't even imported. And so they're exporting nothing. They're exporting a packing slip with nothing in there to, to stand with it. Okay? The heart of God. Think about this. He said, if my people will intercede. So what is God's heart? What is God's heart? If we were to say, what is the what what one word would would be uh the object of God's heart. What is it? People. John 3.16 For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. This is the heart of God. This is why Jesus came. This is the ultimate purpose. This is, this is the purpose. He came to redeem us because we're people. He loves people. God's heartbeat is for humanity. Not so they can hang out and keep doing what they're doing. Because then they can't what? What can't they do if they're living that way? 
They can't have fellowship with him. Sin is a separator. It will separate you from God. It may not damn your soul to hell after you become a Christian because you're out cussing and drinking and running around, but it will separate you in fellowship with God. How do we know? What happened to Adam in the Garden of Eden? The first thing it broke was Adam's fellowship with God. He came down in the cool of the day, as he always did, to walk and commune with his man, and he could begin to say, Adam, where are you? I hid myself because I was naked. Who told you you were naked? Did you eat the fruit of the tree that I told you not to eat of? Well, yeah, but you know, that woman you gave me, she gave it to me and I did eat. You see? Turned him in, it turned, broke his fellowship and made him a liar. Sin breaks your fellowship with God. And God's heart's people. It separates you from the very one who sent Jesus to die for you, to redeem you, to bring you to his heart so that you could be one in fellowship with him. Okay? And then God's saying, I love you, but you're going, but I've done this. You know, your heart's telling you. Even, even as you got the other people going, oh, you don't even have to repent. Just stand around and go ahead, and, you know, it's cool with your God. You know, it's okay that you did this. No, it's not. Okay? So God's heart's people, and I, I, that kind of, you know, I went off a little bit a little bit further than I should have because that's my next point. But God's heart's people. So in prayer, the innocent, my people will humble themselves, stay in subjection, have a willing heart, be obedient to him, and pray. What? Capture his heart. I find something interesting. When people fall in love, they morph. Have you ever noticed that? When they really, I mean, flat out, completely, totally, head over heels, fall in love, they morph. Why? Because they so love that other person, they want, the, they want to do the things they want to do. They want to do the things they enjoy. They, they, they morph. And that's not always a bad thing. Sometimes it can be a bad thing, but most of the time it's not a bad thing. They, they want to honor them. They want to please them because they love them. And see, when you love God, when you get the heart for God, then you're going to want to capture God's heart. And so God says in, in 2 Chronicles, humble yourself, come into subjection. Secondly, pray, intercede. Really, in, in Hebrew, it means more intercession than it does anything else, okay? Uh, intercede for people. Why? Because God loves people. God's for people. He wants them in his kingdom. He wants them delivered out of the kingdom of darkness and translated to the kingdom of his dear son. He wants those people. And so, when we get, when we get here, we're now moving you know, humbling ourselves, being brought in subjection, but not subjection. Oh, God, I can't, I can't go out and drink this weekend. I can't go out and sleep with somebody else's wife, and I can't shoot up, and I can't do all this. Because doggone it, I'll go to hell, see? No, you've, brought, you've been brought in subjection through the Word of God. You're willing. You've got the right heart towards God. You're obeying Him. And by now spending that time in intimacy with Him, what happens? You morph. You begin to capture His heart. And in capturing his heart, guess what? You're not going to want to go out and be sitting in a bar drinking and have somebody you witnessed to last week walk in and see you sitting there and ruin any, you know, and they're going, what are you doing in here drinking? You were just telling me about Jesus last week. And ruin your testimony and push them away from God. And don't let anybody fool you out there, anywhere. Being like the world doesn't win the world. I know Paul said, I am to all things to all people, meaning he could relate to everything, but he didn't do everything. He wasn't out, he wasn't out um, uh, offering sacrifices to idols. Okay? He wasn't out sleeping with, uh, with men in the Romans, where the Romans like the Romans did. He didn't have a calamine lover, calamine lover so he could be like the Romans. That's not what he meant. I mean, I can go into any culture and I can adapt to that culture and understand them and be able to minister to them and relate to them at wherever they are. But it doesn't mean I become them. Jesus ate with the publicans and sinners. He did not become a publican and sinner. Okay? Are you here? He wasn't acting like the publicans. He ate with them and, you know, and, and so had fellowship with them as far as to be able to minister to them, but he wasn't being a publican or sinner. 
So take away these stupid things that people say that they think sound really cool, which is really just showing me they don't have his heart. Because you've got his heart, you're going to want to be in a way that you your testimony. Well, Paul wrote and said something something along this line about that if I should if I should preach this one way and do something different, I would be a castaway. I would find myself being a castaway. God didn't cause me castaways. You can root, and I hate to bring this up, but I, I don't think you know it's it's been long enough, and we all it's 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 more than documented. It was public, it was national. I mean, uh, the Jim Baker stuff, that at PTL, um, you know, I mean, they had that thing going, and they had a scam going. It was a scam. They were raising money because they were spending money. Let's see, they had gold plated faucets in their apartment and all this kind of stuff, and. There was, there was sexual escapades going on. They had 2,000 checking accounts. And they were m moving the money around, floating money through the accounts in circles to keep everything afloat. They were building these buildings, you know, raising money to build this, build this tower. But actually what they were doing is they were paying the note on the one before. That's why they were building this was to get money flowing in so they could be paying over here. And it, and it, and it all collapsed on them. Okay. You cannot imagine the damage that was done to people who got saved watching the, the uh, Praise the Lord show. The people, the people that love show. The people that love show. That's it. You know, they had two PTLs. They had PTL, the PTL club. But PTL came from um, the Trinity Broadcast Network in California where it was PTL was Praise the Lord. And Jim worked for him. Worked with Paul and Jan Crouch. Then he came to the East Coast and started uh, the PTL club uh, and the uh, People That Love club. And you can't even fathom the damage done to those converts who got saved watching that program. I mean, the, the, the damage was extensive. People, people withdrew giving, stopped giving, stopped going to church. St I mean, all kinds of stuff happened because then they thought every preacher was the same way. They were, all, they were all frauds. They were all this. It brought huge damage to the body of Christ. Now, God's forgiven him. He served his time. You know, he's repented. He's remarried. I don't agree with his doctrine. Now, then he's went off, he went completely the other way. You know, he went off the other end. He went, went from one end back to the other end. Wait, you know, swing, just get in the middle of the road. Okay? Now, as ever God makes you suffer, God does this to you. No, you did it to yourself, stupid. Okay? Because you, you, were, you, were, you were living lasciviously, and you were living out of the flesh and not living out of the spirit. Okay? And, um, so, anyway, I, and I'm not doing that to criticize him. This isn't like some I'm, I just revealed to you that nobody knows anything about. And it's, 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 it's out there. Court cases are out there. The documentation is out there. It's, it's, it's well, well documented enough. And he's got a book out there, which, uh, you know, um, which I didn't buy. Anyway, that did damage. So, when you have God's heart, you're not looking for ways to live in sin and still get to heaven. Because what? This is at stake. People are at stake. Well, I've got the right to drink if I want. That seems to be the biggest thing now. That's all people want to be able to do is get, I can drink and be a Christian. They, they, brag, they brag about it. Put, put churches on their websites. I can drink and be a Christian. Well, yeah, I guess you can, but not, not one that's, that, that, that's going to be effective. You're going to do a lot of damage to people. You're going to hurt people. Well, that's their problem. I'm free. No, then you don't have this. You don't have God's heart. Because Paul said, I would abstain from something if it would have caused another's conscience to be offended. Okay? If your liberty becomes a bondage to someone else or a, a stumbling block to someone else. It's not liberty. Right? It's all kinds of stuff. It's wrong. It's a lack of the heart of God. Okay? But yeah, you, you still want to, be, you want to be eating good over here. Right? Yeah. No. See, when we, when we humble ourselves come to subjection and then we pray and we begin to intercede for others, we're capturing God's heart. That's going to change how we act. I said, that's going to change how we act. And, you know, and, the, and so, um, 
in Romans chapter 9, verse 3, let me, let me show you how, how this heart captures people. Romans chapter 9. Paul writing here. He says, um, let's start in verse 1. I say the truth in Christ, I lie not. My conscience also bear me witness in the Holy Ghost. That I have great heaviness and continual sorrow in my heart. Listen to, these, listen to these next words. For I could wish that myself were accursed from Christ <coughs> for my brethren, my kinsmen, according to the flesh. He's with, he's, you know what he's saying? He said, I'm willing to sacrifice myself if it would save them. I would give up my relationship with God if it would save my kinsmen. Now, you can't. Jesus is the only one who could. But you see, he's captured God's heart. God was willing to give himself up, Jesus, to save the people. Paul comes back and says, I'm, I would be, if I could be, if I could be a curse and save them, I'd do it. Not, I'm free, man, and I'm going to drink and party hard and still make heaven. Hope they get in somehow, some way. This is why we don't see revival. We, we call it revival. It's really, you know, a, a sweeping move of God. Because people have lost this. They've lost God's heart. They don't view through the lens of how does God see them and what is my role in helping them see that. And churches are full now of um, sermons on your, how great your life is, is going to be. And that's a good sermon. What Jesus did for you. Those good, are good sermons. Except nobody lets you preach. Get the pride out of your life. Get the arrogance out of your life. Get the heart of God. Humble yourself. Get before God and cry out for others. It's all about how great it is for you. We gotta be, you can't be out of balance. See, before, uh, before the, the charismatic word of faith, really the word of faith revival of, the, of coming in the 70s, you know, it was all over here of, you know, you're, it's just your dog poor, God's going to crush you, God's going to destroy you, God's going to do this to you. you know, and, and so, you know, we, then this message of liberty and freedom came and people began to swing, but what we didn't do is we let it swing all over, over here and get over in the ditch over here. So, number, and so people, want, you can't even talk to people about humbling yourself about putting off things, about sacrificing things out of your life for people. That's, that's infringing on my, my liberties. Paul said, I'm a bondservant to Christ. I know this is a negative confession in our word of faith circles. And I, I'm, listen, I grew up Pentecostal holiness. Got a hold of Brother Hagin's teachings, came on among the uh, charismatic word of faith. People, now Dad Hagen didn't teach a lot of stuff people put off on him. I'm going to tell you that right now. People listening out there, if you've, been, you've got a bad news on Dad Hagen, Kenneth E. Hagen, forget everything you ever heard because it's a lie. He didn't teach that stuff. He didn't teach that excess of stuff. And pe I've seen people's books and I've seen their reports. They cherry pick statements out of a context of something and then twist it to make it say something he never did say. Because he would come back later and, 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 and completely annihilate what they had. Not, not in purposely trying to annihilate it. What he would say would be contrary to what they said he said. Because he, he, he taught in balance. Taught faith. Taught living a, a, the blessed life. Taught these things. But he taught living a humble life. Taught, taught living a consecrated life. Taught a life not, not uh, uh, dishonoring God. He didn't teach prosperity that you can, you, know, you can walk around. He wrote a book called The Midas Take, Good, Touch for Goodness Sake. But how King Midas, everything he touched the gold, and it, 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 it was destructive. That's what that book was about. It's about the excess on prosperity. And they all blame him. He's called the father of the prosperity teaching. Not some of the stuff they're teaching out there. He called them all to Tulsa to, rebu to not rebuke them in a, you, you idiots, but to straighten them out. They didn't listen. So a lot of them didn't listen because they were getting into excess. He was trying to stop it. Because it was going to hurt the church. He knew it would hurt the church. He said this in that meeting in 1989. 
Guys, you're not teaching anything that hadn't already been preached before. Because he said it was taught in the late fifties. I know because I got the notes right. He had his notebooks out. Had the notebooks out. He said it's all in there. I took notes from it back in the fifties. You're not teaching anything new. It's not some kind of new revelation. He said and they got into excess and it killed the move of God. God was moving in that in that time. Revival was going on. There was lots of things happening. He said they got in excess that killed the move of God. And I'm determined not to let that happen again. That was his heart. Why? Because he knew the excess was going to hurt people. But you know, all these preachers were with their you know million dollar you know they had to have their they had to have their million dollar homes and million dollar jets and they had to wear their hand tailored not, not not pastors traveling ministers. Okay, had to have their hand tailored suits and they had their shoes made by a cobbler and you know they had to have the prosperity tie on they had to have all this stuff and it brought a reproach. You can you can live blessed and not have to look like, you know, you know, you just stepped out of uh, uh, the Kennedy estate. Okay? And so you can have the heart of God and be blessed and do the things of God and be blessed. And if you're really going to be blessed of God, then we go back up being humble. Willing and obedient, you'll eat the good of the land. But the heart issue is, is paramount to that. And that heart issue brings you into heart with God. And now we're praying, we're interceding for others. And so that means that's going to govern our actions, which brings us to the next one. And um, I'm going to get this one in before we leave tonight. Hallelujah. Okay? No, actually, I won't get to all of it. <laughs> Seek God's face. All right? So listen, number three is we're to see. Uh, and I don't know if, guys, I'm sorry, if you're on television, if you're watching this, I'm, I'm going to slide my podium out of the way. Because uh, I know you can't. Can, is that all up here now, Jesse? On, on the screen? Can you see all this? I don't know if they got it on a bigger screen. The, the, the podium was hiding it, wasn't it? Okay. He wants us to seek his face. Um, here we're told that we're never, we, we are never to forget where our strength in life comes from. All right, I'm going to turn this a little sideways. Hebrews 12, Hebrews 12, 1. Hebrews 12, 1. Oh, we can go all, you can go all the way down to 3. Um, it says there, you know, uh, I'm going to jump over there real quick. It's one thing about getting a new Bible. It takes a while to break it in. Okay. Wherefore, we're seeing, we are encompassed by, uh, about with so great a cloud of witnesses. Let us lay aside every weight and the sin that does so easily beset us and run with patience the race that is set before us. Notice he said, oh, do what? Lay aside the sin and weights. What are weights? Those things that you could probably get away with saying it's not a sin that holds things back, holds you back, holds your. Okay. All right. Okay. So we're to look to Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith, who's, who for the joy that set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of God, the throne of God. For consider him that endured such contradiction of sinners against himself, lest ye be wearied and faint in your minds. Okay. We're to consider Jesus. Jesus put up with a lot of, Jesus denied a lot of himself a lot of things. He denied himself sleep. He denied himself food. He would fast. He would pray. He would stay up all night. To what? Because of this right here. People. It is the crux. It is the central theme of the ministry of Jesus and the ministry of the apostles in the church and the purposes of the church is, is to get people saved, equip those people so they can go get people saved. And that they live a life that's pleasing and honorable to God so that what? They have a good testimony and they can get people saved. So those people will get saved and they'll follow your example. And they'll have a good testimony, and they'll get people saved. Okay? 
I mean, they got these, these cussing preachers and all this stuff trying to use shock value. That doesn't get people saved. That's a, that's a, that's a religious devil on them. It's a religious demon. I even question if they are saved at all themselves. You know, that, that pastor that, you know, we talked about Sunday, that guy out in Memphis, you know, because he was, had that twerking thing going on in his church, and people were criticizing. And of course they were criticizing it. You posted it like it was some normal thing for women to get up and twerk. That's a vulgar dance. Yeah, it looks like a strip club. And he, his statement to everybody who disagreed with him was, F you. And he didn't, just didn't say F, he said the word. From the pulpit. That was, his, that, was his, that was his response to people criticizing that on his church. That's Jesus. I can see Jesus doing it. Can you see Jesus doing that? I mean, it, the ungodliness, and, and we had that guy years ago, uh, the Scott guy, he used to sit around and smoke a cigar at the mission out there in L.A. He'd smoke a cig cigar and cuss while he was, he was teaching. Now, here's the thing. Um, Dad said a number of years ago, he said, you know, that what happened with him was he used to be a professor at Oral Roberts University. He was one of the best professors on the blood you ever heard. He said he had some of the best teaching on the blood he ever heard. But he got offended about something and got a religious spirit and went off. So we got to go up. We got to stay in subjection to God, even when things happen that hurt us. Why? Because we got to keep the right and willing heart so we can capture God's heart. Because people are at stake. And usually people hurt people who get over there and get that religious kind of religious spirit on them. What happens is they go out and preach their hurt. Or they quite minister out of the hurt that they're better and they care more. And they're not preaching out of the spirit of God. That's why they can cuss. Okay? I mean, there was, there was a guy a number of years ago, he, you know, he, he said the thing, he was up preaching, he went... Um, he, he was up in the pulpit, and he went, um, there are people uh, going to uh, hell right now, and you don't give a D. And then he stopped and went, and you're more concerned about the fact that I cuss in the pulpit than you are people going to hell. He's trying to use shock factor. You don't have to use shock factor. We just bring them into the presence of God. Get people in communion with God. Get them with a heart for God. That, that'll get on you if you'll get in there. We don't have to use shock factor. And then, of course, people start thinking, that, oh, that's cool. That's cool. He could do that. And really, he really got my attention. <laughs> Let no corrupt communication come out of your mouth. But that which is used, good for the use of edifying. To be seasoned with grace. Amen. So I, I don't buy into this stuff that people are doing because it, it shocks a shock factor. The Holy Spirit can arrest you without cussing. Hello. He doesn't have to be vulgar to get your attention. He doesn't. He's not vulgar to get your attention. That's what he's, exactly. He's a gentleman. You're not going to come out of the presence of God cussing. Telling people who disagree with you to, you know, F you. Got a big church. Where's this expensive suits doing it? Because huh, there's, see, there's a spirit in the world that'll draw people to that stuff. You don't think a religious spirit will draw people in there? Draw them in a heartbeat. Wait, why? Well, to offer a substitute for the real. To get them to see. Drug dealers do it all the time. They'll they'll mix rat poison in with drugs. To stretch it. They don't. They don't care if people die from a, from the rat poison. A lot of people don't, but you know, if they do, it's tough. You know, I got. I'll get another customer somewhere. They don't care. They'll put enough of the real stuff in there, so they can get start getting the buzz. But they don't care about the effects of putting rat poison and cutting it with that. They care less. Satan will put enough out there that people will think, oh, that's gospel. And you know, it, It's just like this guy a number of years ago here. Still talking about people, still talking about hearts, still talking about humbling, praying, and now seeking God's face. 
if we're seeking after God, we're not going to come out of there um, going and making up teachings so we can, the guy up in Danville about 30 years ago, um, his wife, you know, they were Pentecostal, but they were old Pentecostal where you couldn't wear makeup and you couldn't cut your hair and all this kind of stuff. And, um, and she started looking haggard. You know, about 30, 40 years of, of that kind of stuff, and you kind of you know, had some young ones, and you're rough looking because you can't wear makeup and you can't cut your hair and all that kind of stuff. And there was a 16-year-old girl in the church, and he got a revelation that God allowed men to have two wives. And, they, and the, parent, the parents of the girl were, gonna, were going to go into agreement that he could have her for a wife, except he couldn't have two wives at one time, and he wasn't going to divorce his first wife, so they were just going to get married in the eyes of God. Now, he's at the gym working out every day, lifting weights and all this stuff. What's happening? That's not, a, that's not God. That is, his flesh has taken over. He sees somebody that looks younger, looks better than his wife. He wants to trade in the old bottle, but he can't because, you know, he's preached scriptures. So what he's going to do? He's going to come up with a new scripture that says, you know, he can have more than one wife. And he's going to teach this whole thing to the church. And he's going to take that little 16-year-old in for his hot new babe. Leave the old wore out model in the other bedroom. Now, who's going to be hurt by this? Well, his wife will, for one, but who all overall is going to be hurt? People. When the cray-cray stuff starts, people get hurt. People get pushed away. Okay? That's why it's so important for us to stay in subjection to God. That's why I said, I said Sunday morning, your heart knows when something's not right. Don't override that. I've got, I've got a, a Facebook well, a friend. I mean, I know him uh, from years ago. I haven't seen him in, in decades, but I know him from years ago. And he wanted to know where this particular minister was because he had been up in his church. He was a scam artist. Found out, you know, he came in churches and going to offer to sell uh, such and such to the churches at such a good deal. Go ahead and get a down payment for it up front and then leave town and never deliver the goods. You see, we were, gull we were gullible. The churches can be gullible. <clears throat> now it's church vans he's doing going around the country to going into churches, saying, look, I, I can get you a church van. Listen, I know that it costs $70,000, but I've got a deal where I can get them for forty. dollars Now I'm going to need twenty up front. And I'll get, you know, we'll get the paperwork done. And churches, oh, he said, he, he preached a good word, loves God, yeah, and, and give him money, and then, then they, he disappears and never hear from him again. So they're on Facebook. Now where is this guy? He's in Texas, North Carolina, up in Ohio, around the country. He's done the same kind of thing all over the place. So much so that the, the Treasury Department's looking for him. Okay? Scam. Who gets hurt? Who gets, what about the person that was in that church service that night that, that anted up money? Maybe they didn't have enough food to eat that week, and they gave the last thing they had so that, you know, their church could have that new sound system or that new van, and they gave us money so he could get that $10,000 up front to that guy. What happens to them? In all likelihood, they fall away from God especially if they were a baby Christian, okay? They, they get turned away. They, their heart turns away. They don't want anything to do with the things of God. I've seen it happen more than once. My, um, I, my own brother, my older brother, um, yeah, if I say, am I still in? Yeah, move it. My own brother, a number of years ago, uh, after I got saved, after Jamie and I were saved and married, early, our early marriage year, first couple of years, um, <clears throat> over in another town near us, um, so his best friend has started going to church and got saved. I mean, you know, they, their family had been Christians, but they had been kind of carnal Christians in and out, that kind of stuff. Not, you know, it, it was it was interesting how how families can be. They can be serving God, be Pentecostal, be you know, Holy Spirit filled, and be carnal as the day is long. Okay, and um, but this brother, his wife got saved, and then his brother, uh, one of his brothers came in, and then my, because he was my brother's best friend. Him and my sister all started going, and they were going to church every Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night. Well, about less than a year later, he stopped going to church. And I'm, you know, I'm like, I'm, I'm excited. He's, gotten, he's, he's going to church, serving God. What happened? Well, this can't flamboyant, uh, charismatic minister was banging his best friend's brother's wife. My brother hadn't wanted to have a thing to do with church since. Since. You can't hardly drag him in for a funeral. Had, 
nothing to do with God. He got, he felt like he got burned, and he did. He got burned by this, and it destroyed his life as far as going to be, be serving God. It destroyed it. Has nothing, no, absolutely no desire to have anything to do with God. Nothing. Because he thinks that's the way it is. It's not the way it is, but that's how he feels. Because of that, people get hurt. We have to see God's face. We say have to stay pure before God. When we do that, we we are enabling people. Now, that mean we're perfect. And I'm not going to put that stupid bumper sticker on my car. Christians aren't perfect. They're just forgiven. I, I, I'm not going to put that stupid, dumb sticker out there. Okay? It's a dumb sticker. I'm sorry. Now, if you got it, I'm sorry. Take it off. All right. Dick, I'm sorry. Get it off your van. Okay. <laughs> Saw it last week. That's why I said something. Yeah. Yeah. Um, let your life demonstrate the forgiveness God's granted to you. You can testify about the, you know, yeah, I failed, but you know what? God's merciful. And don't let my failure hurt you because I've missed it. You know? Now, now, that guy, that church that was going, it was, they, they got it 200 plus running. I mean, they were just going and blowing, and then it just blew up. Well, of course, you got a pastor sleeping with somebody's wife. It don't take long to blow it up. Hello? You get all, all out of track with God. I saw a 5,000 member church die in two years. Die. Gone. From 5,000 to 200 in less than a year. 5,000 people. You get, out of, you get out of line with what God has, and you'll get. That's why we got to seek His face. That's why we got to stay in tune with God. That's why I got to stay after the heart of God. Because people are at stake. In the end of all this, people are at stake. Their, their eternal salvation, their eternal destiny is at stake. Amen? All right. I got to close here tonight. We'll pick up the last one tomorrow, uh, next week, and then the uh, what God's going to do in response to us doing the four things. So we got through three of them. Um, if someone wants to take a picture, that'd be good. And uh, if you want to type it up, that'd be even better. Um, you know, because I got a lot of added stuff in here that are not in my notes. That's because the Holy Ghost takes over and starts teaching. All right, all right. Um, we uh, we paid off another card yes this week. Yeah, yeah. We saw, we saw another. Another part of our consumer debt goes to zero. Yep, yep. I'm excited. I'm so excited watching this happen. Praise the Lord. Amen. Yeah. Um, there were there were seven different ones starting the first year. We're down to four. Yeah. So I mean, that's the four big ones, but there's still four. Okay, and they're going away. They're going away. As a matter of fact, this card got paid off uh, a month and a two month two and a half months early. I've written a kind of a schedule out and drove it out. So how you know how's everything goes? It's two and a half months early from what it was projected to be paid off. So, um, of course, one of the other ones was like two months early or three months early. It's just happening. Uh, praise the Lord! Like we, you know, we, we envision God's got 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 this thing rolling. Amen. <laughs> Hallelujah. I, I just got. I just. I kind of keep thinking about you know it being paid off by the end of the year. Everything being paid off by the end of the year. I just. I kind of get that. <laughs> It's, it's, it's happening. Glory to God. Amen. I'm just so excited. And excited for all the people giving, you know. It's, it's a blessing for y'all to be part of it. And uh, it's, time, it's time to give. If you're not offering an envelope, raise your hand. If you're giving electronically, go ahead and do that. If you're watching us by Internet, uh, the information just gone up on the screen for you to be able to give um, to our church. Or you can give to our debt destruction campaign. You can be a part of that. And, um, you know, you, you, can, you can bless that and be a part. We'd love to have you uh, join us and seeing us go debt-free. Uh, our plan uh, the plan we had was to get us out by um, May of next year. Actually, it was by June of Ju June, end of June of next year. We've already got it's already back to May. We've already back, it's already backed up two months um, from what our original projection was. So I'm gonna believe it's gonna keep backing up. Amen. 
Our original projection had us at the end of June. At parents right now, we're on, we're on schedule to pay off 1st of May, which is basically the end of April. Um, so we're, 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 we're two months ahead of schedule already in two months. <laughs> Hallelujah. So if you want to be a part of that and join us on, on giving in this campaign to remove debt from the church so we can go do other things besides pay debt uh, and pay interest, uh, we're losing about six, we've been losing uh, about seven to eight, maybe more thousand dollars a year in interest. <clears throat> that all, that's all money that could, be, could have gone to the kingdom. All of that money could have been used in the kingdom instead of paying off interest. Okay. Joe, you got an envelope? I mean, not an envelope, but a prayer cloth? Oh, okay. Okay. All right. I thought it was a prayer cloth. I was going to pray over it. All right. All right. Father, in Jesus' name, we bless the people as they tithe and give and help with our uh, and, and support uh, the removal of debt from the church. We thank you that you open heaven's windows and bless them abundantly and pour out blessings they don't have room enough to receive. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. We're glad you joined us tonight here at Faith and Victor Church. Join us again on Sunday morning at 10, 30, well, 11 o'clock. And then next Wednesday night, same time here. Until then, remember this. This is the victory that overcomes the world, even our faith. Love you. God bless you. We'll see you next time.